Okay, if we could please turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 7 down to verse 13 as we consider the church of the open door, Philadelphia. And so it begins this way in Revelation 3, verse 7. It says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. But thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven uh, from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And again, God always blesses the reading of his word. So Philadelphia was a small city uh, compared to some of the others. It was 28 miles uh, southeast of Sardis. Uh, it was in a very agricultural area. And uh, this area, uh, partly because of uh, previous uh, volcanic eruption, uh, was actually perfect for growing vineyards. And so wine was its speciality. And so this particular area, uh, it was very much known for the quality of the vineyards. And the patron deity of Philadelphia uh, was somebody called Dionysus. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the Dionysus is the Greek uh, god, and the Roman equivalent is Bacchus. And uh, Bacchus uh, is the god of wine. And so the worship of Bacchus or Dionysus uh, was attended by what they call uh, Bacchanalian orgies. And that was the idea that uh, the people would get drunk with wine. And then all that goes along with that, the licentiousness, the wickedness. And so it was really famous uh, for uh, these Bacchanalian orgies uh, of the most licentious kind. Uh, the, the city got its name, uh, actually came into existence in 189 BC. It was named uh, after a king of Pergamum, or Pergamos, who was named Attalus II. And he built the city uh, as a tribute to his brother, who he loved, Eumenes II. <laughs> and so that's how the name Philadelphius uh, uh, came to, into existence. Uh, it was uh, a city that was built because of the love that a man had for his brother. And that's because we, we know the meaning of Philadelphia. It is brotherly love, uh, brotherly affection. And it is very significant that in the New Testament, uh, this word Philadelphia, so Philadelphia, the Greek word actually is used seven times and uh, it's used of the, the fellowship of the saints in New Testament times. And I want you just to look at these references. They're, they're always encouraging to be reminded of Romans chapter 12, uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, where we read this. It says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, with Philadelphia in honor, preferring one another. And then in 1 Thessalonians, again, just this repeated emphasis in the New Testament that this uh, affection, this brotherly love should be so shown amongst the saints. And we'll talk a little bit about the reason why in a moment. But 1 Thessalonians 
uh, chapter 4 and verse 9, again we read, uh, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Uh, so taught of God to love one another. The book of Hebrews, again, same concept being conveyed, chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. And then in Peter's first epistle, so, so far we've been looking at Paul and his uh, emphasis on brotherly love. And now First Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And then Second Peter Twice, uh, Peter will mention it in one verse, in chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, he says this, this is kind of adding to your faith. It says, verse 7, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity. And then the final reference is here uh, in chapter 3 and verse 7, where it's written to the church of Philadelphia or the church of brotherly love. And again, why is it so stressed here? Why is it so important, uh, this truth? Well, uh, if you remember, we said that the, the kind of culture in Philadelphia was uh, connected with these uh, drunken orgies. And for the, the children of God, they can't be part of that anymore. And so they're, they, they kind of feel like they're, maybe they're missing out on that social world uh, that is connected with wine. And so uh, what do they do? How do they, uh, how do they get on? Well, they have the love of the brethren. And uh, how thankful we are that there's another spirit working in the love of the brethren. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to love one another with a pure heart fervently. And, and so it replaces that. And I, I know for ourselves, what, for myself getting saved, uh, I, my social world uh, revolved around the pub and drinking and all the rest of it. And I remember when I uh, first came in contact with Christians, uh, my thought was, well, what do you do if you don't go to the pub? I can't imagine life outside of that. A and yet I came to realize uh, the wonderful uh, joy of fellowship with like-minded brethren, brotherly love. It's wonderful. And, uh, and so it's so essential and again, as we reach people in our world today, uh, bringing them into this sweet communion of God's people is a wonderful thing. And so that's why I emphasize it so much in the New Testament. Again, for people coming out of a pagan culture, uh, losing out, ex uh, in a sense, uh, it's, not, it's not that you don't want to go to the pub anymore. They don't want you there anymore when you're a believer in Christ. And so you lose that former comradeship that you once had and instead though you're brought into a much sweeter communion uh, that of the saints and so again we, we see that all, all these churches in the new testament they lived in a very pagan culture and every generation has its challenges and difficulties and it would have been challenging to walk with the lord in a culture known for drunken orgies that you come out of that you've been saved out of that and yet it's it has its challenges and so this church one of the wonderful things about philadelphia is that like smyrna we will not see any rebuke here at all uh, nothing but commendation no rebuke just commendation from the lord and it's a wonderful thing uh, that he commends them and he encourages them of course, I think every Christian church would love to see themselves as Philadelphia. Uh, we don't want to think of ourselves as Laodicea. We certainly don't want to be Sardis, a name that you live, but you're dead. Uh, if, we, if we really had our choice, we'd say, well, we belong to Philadelphia, uh, because there's, there's a wonderful things about this particular church. Uh, we prefer not to be Smyrna because who wants to be persecuted? We, but, but we like this. We like Philadelphia. And so it says to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, uh, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens, no man shuts, shuts and no man opens. Now, what's very interesting is that this greeting doesn't refer back to chapter one. Uh, 
so far, it's almost every time the Lord has appeared, there's been a direct reference to the vision in chapter one, but not here. And, and partly because the Lord is not acting as priest judge in this assembly. He's not, there's nothing to, com to, to condemn, uh, only to commend. So he's not mentioned in those things, those the capacities you find in chapter one. But what we are reminded of is the fact that the Lord Jesus is holy. And again, that's an en encouraging idea, isn't it? Uh, he remains th the holy one. And, and it's encouraging them to remain holy in the midst of a very ungodly culture. They have been brought to know the one who is holy. And it's an encouragement. And again, that's what the Peter says, right? Be holy for I am holy, saith the Lord. And, and so he is holy. And isn't that wonderful that the Lord Jesus was holy. Uh, there was nothing in him uh, that was contrary to holiness. He was set apart from sin, set apart to God in absolute perfection. He was holy. And if we want to know what holiness looks like, I mean, we're told to be holy. Well, what does that really look like practically? Well, it looks like the Lord Jesus. If you want to know how to live a holy life, look at his life. He'll, he will reveal to you uh, holiness in all of its beauty. And so, again, we want to just emphasize this is what holiness looks like. It looks like the Lord Jesus Christ. Study his life, how to respond on the different provocation, different so circumstances, uh, how we should respond and relate to sinners. Uh, see how he acts. Uh, again, he was not ashamed to, to be holy in this world, and we're encouraged to be holy. I remember one time many years ago, I did a study on holiness in the scriptures, and I, I noticed that the, the, the word holy, it's kind of a fascinating word, but it actually, the English word holy comes from uh, a, a, an Anglo-Saxon word, halig, which literally means well, as opposed to sick. And I like that. In a world that is really sick. Last night we were preaching on R Romans chapter three and that horrible description of the human race and, and uh, the corruption and destruction and misery in all their ways. And, and, and it's, it's just sick, uh, everything from the head right down to the, to the feet, it's all sick. And yet holiness is being well in a world of sickness. This is what wellness looks like. This is what it looks like to be to be holy, to be healthy, to be well. It looks like Christ. And so see how he acts. Uh, again, the one who was holy. Uh, one of the things is true, too. We, we never reach the world by becoming like it, by imitating it. We reach the world by being like him. Holiness. And so he reveals himself as he that is holy. And then it says, not only is he holy, but he's also true. And again, isn't that wonderful? In a world of deception and lies. And I've just been thinking about that recently. I, I find it hard to know what to believe anymore. But one thing I can believe is him. Because he is true. Uh, he, he is true. He is the... Uh, true in every way, truthful. Everything the Lord Jesus said is the truth, because he is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything he said about God, everything he said about heaven, everything he said about hell was the truth. He can be absolutely trusted. He was true, genuine, real in every way, uh, true to his name and all that it implies, in every aspect. And of course, he uses that term quite frequently. He talks about he's the true bread that came down from heaven. It's not saying that the manna wasn't wasn't real. It, it was, but, but what the manna pictured, that which satisfies the heart of man, well, that's the Lord Jesus. He's the true manna. He's the true vine. Uh, and again, the idea is this, that if anybody's ever going to bring fruit to God, uh, it has to be in connection with him. He is the true vine. And so uh, he's the reality of what the manna and the vine were intended to convey. He is the true uh, one. And so the, he that is holy, he that is true. 
And then it says, he that hath the key of David, and he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Of course, a key represents authority. The one who has authority over the lock and the door. He has authority over all creation. He opens a door, no one can shut it. He shuts a door, nobody can open it. He is the one that has the key of David. Now, again, where does this come from? Again, there's an Old Testament reference here, and I want us to look back to Isaiah chapter 22, uh, where we find this reference. Prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 22 and verse 22. Uh, we read about it, but just to get the overall context, we'll begin reading in verse 15, Isaiah 22, uh, verse 15. It says, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go uh, get thee unto the treasurer, even to Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here? He that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock, behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of the Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, strengthen him with thy girdle. I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, and he shall open and none shall shut he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Now just stop there. I just want you to get the big picture here. And the big picture was this, that there was a man called Shebna and he had the keys to the treasury. <laughs> this is in the days of Hezekiah. And so he actually had the key to the treasury. And, and yet he, it seems that he was using it for his own purposes. And he was kind of feathering his own nest and in, in the process was building a grave for himself. But God is going to judge him and he's going to replace him with this man, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And he would then have the keys. Uh, he can open the treasury. He's going to be the new treasurer. And the idea is this, and it's a beautiful picture, uh, that Christ is telling us that he is now the one that has the keys of all the treasuries of heaven. Not just the treasuries of Hezekiah, but the treasuries of heaven. All the access to the treasures of heaven comes to us through the Lord Jesus. And it's good for this church in Philadelphia, we're going to see that they were kind of feeble. <laughs> uh, they were weak. They had a little strength. And what the Lord is saying to them is, because you know me, because you are in a relationship with me, I'm going to open up all the resources of the heavenly treasury for your benefit. <laughs> and that, isn't that a wonderful thing? We, we recognize our weakness, but where, where do we get our strength from? From the Lord. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. All the treasuries of, of wisdom uh, and knowledge come to us through Christ. He is the one that provides everything we need. And so uh, all things that are necessary come from him. So just as Eliakim had complete control of the house, even the Lord is in complete control in terms of Christian service. He has the key to all the resources and also is the one that can open door of ministry for us. And so he says concerning them, he says, uh, speaking of himself, he's the one that has the key to these treasuries. And then he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So 
first of all, I, I know thy works. And I just, I think it's lovely that the Lord knows. Uh, he knows where people are and he knows what they're doing for him. It might be hidden to the eyes of men, but the Lord knows what they're doing. And I, I'm reminded of the verse in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, where it says, uh, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And isn't it good that God is not forgetful? <laughs> he knows what, what's being done. Even if there's not much recognition down here, the Lord knows what you're doing for him. Uh, and especially as you minister to the saints in his name and on his behalf. And so the Lord uh, tells us, I, I know your works. And then he says, I have set before you an open door. And it would seem that despite their weakness, God had opened the door for them to preach the gospel. He'd given them an open door of service, an open door of ministry. It is interesting that uh, from, from a historical point of view, Philadelphia also opened the way to spread. It was kind of at, a, at an entrance of an of a area that was, uh, was very barbarian. And the thought of building the city was to open the door to spread Greek culture and that's that's what made a difference between somebody who was a barbarian and somebody who wasn't was uh, the, the, they had imbibed the culture of the Greeks, which was kind of supposedly very civilized and all the rest of it, as opposed to barbarian. And so even the city itself, it was kind of a missionary city for Greek culture. And the Lord is saying to this little assembly that I've opened the door for you too to spread something far better than Greek culture, the gospel of the grace of God. And so they were engaged in the Great Commission. An open door had been given to them. And again, if the Lord gives us an open door, uh, we, we need to go through it. Uh, an open door uh, is a tremendous thing, uh, but to, to not go through it uh, is a very serious thing. They had gone through this open door. They had, uh, they had taken the opportunity uh, to spread the word of God. And... Um, Again, we need to make sure that the Lord gives, that we pray for open doors. And if, if we pray for them and the Lord gives them, we walk through them. We take the opportunities that he gives us. And so they obeyed the commission. Uh, and again, it's good to remind ourselves that when we leave the meeting, I remember one assembly I was in, it used to say on the, on the uh, door, uh, you are now entering the mission field. <laughs> As you go out of the assembly building, you are now entering the mission field. And so uh, forget, <clears throat> if we forget the open door, we can become very introspective. Uh, we need an outward focus to reach the world we find ourselves in. And I want to just kind of take up this phrase open door because it's used very frequently in the word of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, I'm just going to look at a few references. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, and we'll notice this. It says, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And so even when the Lord opens a door, I don't mean to say there's not going to be opposition. Uh, and Paul recognized that there was lots of opposition, but he surely had been given a great and effectual open door to serve the Lord uh, in the Gentile world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 12, again, we get this. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Uh, look back in the book of Acts, chapter 16, again, where we see more references to the Lord giving open doors. Acts 16, uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. And Paul perceived that this is an open door. God is, there's this vision, come and help us uh, in Macedonia. Now, sometimes the Lord closes doors. And so notice earlier in chapter 16, verse 6 and 7, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, and they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. 
but the spirit suffered them not. And so uh, they endeavored to go in a certain direction. The Lord clearly shut that door. Now, later on, that door would open for them. But at this point, God shuts that door. But he opens a door into Europe. Later on, he'll open a, a very effectual door into Asia. But at this point, he closes it. Acts 14. Another reference to this idea of open doors. 14 verse 27. It says, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So if we could say this, I think it would be a very good thing for us to pray to the one who has the key. <laughs> Remember the law says, I've got the key of David. And when I open, no one shuts. When I shut, no one opens. And we need to pray, Lord, would you open doors? Open doors for the gospel. Open doors for, for us to be able to, to, to preach Christ's gospel in this world. And even as we go about our daily affairs, Lord, would you open a door for me to speak to some soul about the Savior today? He is the one who opens doors. And so the Lord says to them, I have set before you an open door. And we said it was a missionary city to, to reach uh, people with the Greek language and culture. Uh, but now uh, a much better message. A door had opened into the, and for Philadelphia, it was opening the door into the region of Lydia and uh, Phrygia. Uh, and uh, they had great success in this, in spreading Greek culture. But the, for this little assembly, God opened the door. And he says, no one can shut it. And then he notices that they have a little strength. And that could mean several things. It could mean that they were very conscious of their weakness. It could mean that it was just a small assembly. Uh, not 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 large numerically. Remember, it's a smaller city. But the Lord says that they they had a little strength. Uh, again, their their smallness is what we notice here. Uh, but yet, um, the Lord loves small opportunities like that, doesn't he? In fact, uh, he, he one of the things he tells us in the Word of God is that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so uh, we're, when, we're, when we're weak, we're in a good place. And Lord commends them. And he, he says, you have a little strength, which means that there are people that have no option but to depend on him. This, this open door, it's wide and effectual. How are they going to do it? They're very small. They're weak. But the Lord says, I, I'll, I, I'll meet your need. And God is not looking for strength in us because he has all the strength we need. His strength is to be perfected in our weakness. And so uh, they had a little strength. And then he says, you have kept my word. And, and that word kept there means that they've obeyed it. They're, they're, they're a group of believers that are serious about obeying the word of God. Uh, the, the, the word of God played a big part in this assembly. Uh, they loved the word of God and they, they sought by his grace to obey it. And of course, there's always blessing when we obey the word of God. Just as when we disobey, the spirit of God is grieved. And he loves to see this loyalty that they had towards him. Despite their smallness, uh, they, they kept his word. And I, I think it's good to remind ourselves sometimes um, there, there are many, what we would say today, mega churches. And um, not saying that there's not some genuine believers in them or that God may not use them in some ways, but, but there's a lot of scripture that is just set aside, clear scripture that is just set aside. And, and so here, here's a small assembly and they're weak, but they're very serious about keeping the word of God. And the Lord sees that and the Lord values that. He says, you have kept my word. And then he says, you've not denied my name. And of course, his name is very important. His name represents his nature. They believed in his name. Uh, they met in his name. It, his name had a prominent role. It's interesting that 
uh, he's going to talk in a little while about the synagogue of Satan, and they did not <laughs> appreciate that name. Look back at the book of Acts for a second in chapter 3, Acts chapter 3 and verse 14, and compare here. In Acts 3, 14, it talks about a people, um, the Jewish people, the who is going to refer to as the synagogue of Satan here, but it says in Acts 3, verse 14, but you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Uh, they denied the Holy One and the just, and yet he could say to the church of Philadelphia, thou hast not denied my name. Uh, they, they loved that name. It was very precious to them. And isn't it wonderful? Uh, Thy name we love, Lord Jesus. That's one of the wonderful hymns we sing. We love that name. It's a, that name is 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 melodious to our ears. It's it's a beautiful name, uh, the name of the Lord Jesus. It's very precious to us and all that it implies. And so he says to them, uh, Thou hast not denied my name. They met in his name. They loved that name. It was very precious. They wanted to honor that name, to magnify that name. Uh, they wouldn't want to do anything that would cause anyone to think negatively of that lovely name. And then he says, and it's a wonderful promise that he gives to them here. It tells us that there was opposition. He says, behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. And so there's this open door, but just as Paul said, there are many adversaries, and it would seem that the, the adversary uh, was working through what he calls the synagogue of Satan. So there was a Jewish population there, and of course we see the early church so often the opposition uh, came from Judaism. Uh, they were the ones that were whipping up the opposition to the gospel. Uh, we saw already this reference to the synagogue of Satan in chapter 2, in verse 9, uh, where uh, he, he speaks uh, of uh, this church in Smyrna. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan." And so we've already seen the synagogue of Satan. We see it again now, Jews, but they're not. Uh, and uh, the Lord says that he's going to do something wonderful. These people that are opposing, that are hostile, he says, actually, I'm going to make them to come and worship before thy feet to know that I have loved thee. And so how's that going to work? The persecutors would be humbled before them. Have we seen that in scripture? Oh, yes, we have. Remember Saul of Tarsus? Uh, I mean, he, he was a hostile persecutor, and he's on his way to Damascus, and he's, he's going there with one intent, uh, to, to cause havoc amongst the church. And how, do, what, how does it all end up? Well, it ends up he's actually worshiping in their very midst. Uh, amazing. So the Lord's good at this. Uh, let me give you another example uh, where the Lord is able to turn, as it were, the persecutors, uh, turn things around and make the persecutors humbled in the presence of the saints. Look at 1 Corinthians and, uh, oh, oh, sorry, look at Acts 18, and then we'll go at 1 Corinthians, but look at Acts 18 and the beginning of the Corinthian assembly, and we'll notice uh, something very fascinating about the assembly in Corinth. And so uh, in chapter 18, verse 8, it says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. And so the first thing we see is that the chief ruler of the synagogue gets converted this man called Crispus, and now becomes part of the group that are meeting next door that are worshiping the Lord Jesus. And so there's Crispus. But then there's the guy who replaces him. Look at verse 17. Then the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat because he had whipped up opposition against the Christians and uh, it didn't go so well for him, and he was beaten. Now look at 1 Corinthians 
in chapter one, verse one, just bearing in mind this second chief ruler of the synagogue is a man called Sosthenes, replacing Crispus. In 1 Corinthians 1, it says, Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. <laughs> so uh, it, it seemed like it wasn't a safe place to be, to be the chief ruler of the synagogue. You were you were prime target to get saved if you were the chief ruler of the synagogue. And so the idea is this, that the Lord is promising that the persecutors would be humbled before them. Not speaking of all the Jews, but the opposers of the salvation of mankind, God will let them know that these believers are on the right side. He says, I'll make them come and worship before thy feet and know that, know that I have loved thee. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Show them I, I really loved thee. These people were right all along, uh, and you guys were wrong. And so I'm going to take care of this for you, the Lord is telling them. God is going to take care of, of uh, as it were, vindicating those that had followed Christ. And, uh, of course, uh, where does this come from? Again, remember, there's lots of Old Testament allusions here. But I want you to go back with me to the prophecy of Isaiah. And we think about this scripture where he says, I will make them in the synagogue of Satan, which say they're Jews and are not, and do lie, I'll make them come and worship before thy feet. Isaiah 60 and verse 14, we have a little glimpse at the millennial kingdom. Isaiah 60 and verse 14. And it tells us, Isaiah 60 verse 14, it says, the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet and they shall call thee the city of the lord the zion of the holy one of israel and so this is where this scripture comes from it's from isaiah 60 verse 14 and of course in this context it's talking about the hostile nations in the in the coming millennium are going to submit to israel but here he's showing that the hostile Jews are going to come and submit uh, before the true believers. How is that going to work? This word um, back in our passage, uh, this word worship uh, has the idea of kiss towards the feet. That's literally what it means. And so uh, on a local level, we could say that some of the synagogue of Satan would be converted and just again like we see in the words of first corinthians i want you to go and look first corinthians 14 this is the idea that's going to be brought before them first corinthians 14 verse 23 it says if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers they will they not say that you are mad but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned. He is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus the secrets of his heart are made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. And I believe that's exactly the idea that's being conveyed here. You're not going to worship the saints. The saints wouldn't want to be worshipped. They're going to worship the Lord in the presence of the saints. That's the idea. And so uh, he's going to say uh, that the worship is really not directed to the assembly, but Christ in the midst of the assembly. They're going to come and bow. And now, of course, ultimately, in a coming day, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, the one that humbled himself is going to be exalted and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And guess where we're going to be when this occurs? <laughs> when every knee bows, we're going to be with him as his, his bride. And, and so they're going to bow in the very same way. So then he goes on in verse 10. He says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. And so <clears throat> there's another promise 
for these believers. Uh, it wasn't easy to live in Philadelphia. The drunken orgies, the opposition from Judaism, but they have kept the word of my patience. Uh, they, they have, they, like the Lord Jesus, uh, who endured uh, even the cross, right? They they stayed on the two. Uh, they, they didn't quit. They stuck to the task. They were patient in serving the Lord. And the Lord acknowledges that. And so he makes a promise to them because of their loyalty to him, despite difficulty and opposition. He says that there's a trial coming. And this trial is going to come on all the world. And this trial is going to be specifically designed it's going to come on all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, this phrase, those that dwell upon the earth, pay attention because we're going to see a lot of this in the book of Revelation. They're called the earth dwellers. These are the people who are saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. This is our world. And the trial is going to try the earth dwellers. They're, going to, they're basically going to uh, suffer tremendously in this time of trial that will come on the whole world. And yet he promises that those that were loyal to the Lord Jesus, these Philadelphian church, he's going to keep them from the hour of trial. Now, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, the language here, because uh, in the Greek, it's the word, I'll keep them, the word is ek, ek, from which we get the church, ecclesia, called out company. And so the idea is, uh, it, it's, the, it's the word out of. <laughs> uh, ecclesis is to call, ek is, is out of. And so we're called out of the world. And ultimately, ultimately this hour of trial is going to come on the whole world. The, the true church loyal to Christ is going to be called out at the rapture and so it's not you see he could have wrote i, I will keep them uh, the word n or dear uh, I, i'll keep them in the hour of trial or i'll keep them through the hour of trial but he didn't use any of those words he says i'm going to keep them out of it <laughs> he, he's going to keep us out just like enoch was caught out before the flood the true church is going to be caught out before the hour of trial. He's going to take us out of that trial. He'll keep them, not through it, but out of it, this trial that's going to come on the whole world. And so we could say this, that Philadelphia was a church that was looking for the rapture. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for the one who is going to call them out before the hour of trial comes on the whole world. So notice verse 11, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Basically, it's telling them, watch, work, and wait. Reward is coming. I'll come quickly. It's the thought of suddenly. Don't lose your reward in heaven by being led astray. We can't lose our salvation. But it is possible to lose reward. And of course, one of the rewards is for all those that love is appearing. A crown will be given to those that love is appearing. Don't lose your reward. Keep your focus on the, on the coming Christ. Keep vigilant. And, and so I come quickly. Hold that fast. Hold, hold fast. Do not give up bearing of the name. Do not give up keeping the word of God. And the patience waiting of Christ. Don't give up on these things. The things that you are doing so well that I'm commending. Don't give up on these things. Don't, whatever you do, lose your reward. Don't let somebody else get your reward. And again, it's good to be reminded of this. Paul was concerned about the reward. He, the last thing he wanted was to be a castaway, to be set aside and to lose his crown. And at the end of his life, he could say, I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Uh, henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He knew he was going to get the reward because he lived with that reward in view. But it is possible for Christians to suffer not loss of salvation, but loss of reward uh, because we lose 
uh, that thought of the Lord coming quickly. And we settle down and we lose that sense of imminency and we, we lose that um, uh, cutting edge, if you like, of living in the expectancy of the coming of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse uh, 15. It, it talks about if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And so there's a danger for somebody at the judgment seat of Christ to suffer loss. And that is loss of reward, not loss of salvation, but loss of reward, that their service is nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. They're going to stand in a pile of ashes because they haven't been living with the expectancy of the imminency of Christ coming and holding fast and carrying on. Uh, they've they've lost, uh, lost that sense of imminency. And so he, he tells us in verse 12, him that overcometh, these are the rewards for the one who is the overcomer. I'm going to make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him my new name. Just interesting how personal this is. He talks about the temple of my God. He talks about uh, the name of my God. He talks about the city of my God. Uh, and he says, which will come down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. So very personal, this, uh, the Lord using this phrase, my, over and over again. And what he's saying to them is this. He's going to make them a pillar. Now, what's the idea of a pillar? Well, a pillar is the idea of stability. But to remember that this, these seven churches they were in a very uh, earthquake-prone area of the world. And there's, there's lots, and we see it today, even Tur Turkey, constantly, lots of earthquake. And this, this all is, these seven churches are all in Turkey. And so uh, pillars sometimes wouldn't be so stable <laughs> because of the earthquake activity, but he is going to give those that have been loyal to him, the reward is they're going to be pillars, uh, just like uh, we read about the apostles, that they were pillars in the church, James, a pillar in the church, something solid, something stable. And of course, uh, we think uh, in the, the temple in the Old Testament, uh, one of the pillars was called Boaz, which means strength. <laughs> and so uh, they're going to be uh, eternally stable. When everything around them is collapsing, they are going to be eternally stable. And that's a wonderful promise. Uh, certainly, as we said, Philadelphia was like California. It was earthquake, earthquake country. But a pillar was stable, strong, and safe. And he's going to make them like that. I will make them a pillar in the temple of my God. And then he says he shall go no more out. And again, when the, the temple of, uh, of Bacchus, uh, because of the earthquake, sometimes they had to flee out. They had to get out of there. As soon as they could hear the, tr the tremors, they had to get out. And again, this is uh, the overcomer. He's going to be a temple. And he's, he's not going to have to flee in any way uh, from uh, the, everything about his future is stable and solid. They would have to abandon the city, uh, afraid of aftershocks, not for him, uh, the, the, the overcomer. Eternal stability, eternal strength. And then he says, I'm going to write upon them the name of my God. In an ancient culture, uh, something that belonged to you, you wrote your name on it. So even some of the slaves, they would have their master's name burn onto their skin it was the, that's who they belonged to that's who they were owned by and so uh, i can remember even in, in school uh when going to school uh, all my clothes i had to have my name sewn into them uh because it's it belongs to you uh you don't want to lose it it belongs to you and so the lord is showing these belong to me uh, you remember aaron the high priest he had uh, this headpiece with holiness unto the Lord written on, on it. And uh, again, just uh, the same idea is this. Jesus writes upon us 
uh, a name of his God saying where we belong. And if you look to Revelation 22, we'll see that that's, again, repeated that same idea. Revelation 22, verse 4, it says, They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And what a contrast that is to another group in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 13 and verse 17. It says, Revelation 13, verse 17, it says that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so in this coming day that's going to come on the earth, each will be known by who owns him. Some, they're going to sell their soul to the beast system and it will be written on them. And yet there are those that are sold out to, to the Lord Jesus, and he will write the name of his God upon them. And so he says, uh, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, uh, not connected with, with mystery Babylon, but we're going to be con connected with the new Jerusalem, even the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, the eternal abode of the state of the saints from my God, I'll write upon him, my new name again, uh, new, his new name, some intimacy about Christ that we will learn uh, in for, for being overcomers. So he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. But until that happy day comes, when we enter into our reward, what we need to do is let brotherly love continue. <laughs> like Philadelphia, let brotherly love continue. Now, just a couple of uh, leftover things we need to deal with, and then we'll, we're done. The catchphrase is open and shut. I'm going to give you an open door. No one can shut it. From church history, we're looking at the 19th century. Despite the smallness uh, of evangelical testimony, God set an open door in the, in the 19th century. And it was a time of great revivals. It was a time of great missionary enterprise. These are the days of William Carey and Hudson Taylor. The 19th century was, was the time of, of the open door. And despite higher criticism and liberalism. There was a remnant that held fast to his name and didn't deny uh, his word, but kept his word. Uh, and so it was a time of weakness, but tremendous blessing in open door. And of course, in terms of uh, connecting this section with the Old Testament, it's the days of Hezekiah. That's when this passage in Isaiah 22 and Eliakim is connected with the reign of Hezekiah. And the idea was this, that uh, after Hezekiah, you have Manasseh and you have judgment coming. After Philadelphia, <laughs> what have you got? Laodicea, judgment is coming. <laughs> and so this is the last kind of revival, uh, uh, significant revival before the certainty of judgment kicks in. And so we could say that this is referencing hezekiah and that time frame and so again for all of us the message is simple and the simple message is this don't lose the imminency of the coming of christ don't let anybody steal your reward live today in the light of that day serve him with full hearts may god encourage us with these thoughts Amen.